Good evening and welcome. My name is Chase Rend and I have the honor of being the executive director here at the National Building Museum and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you for this evening's very special program. Uh, tonight's talk relates directly to the National Building Museum's mission which is not only to celebrate the built environment but also to emphasize its impact on our lives. But when our built world is threatened with destruction as the result of natural disasters, such as the ones we've seen along the Gulf Coast, and most recently in the flooding along the coast of New Jersey and New York, that impact is drawn into sharp focus. That, in fact, is the topic of an exhibition the museum is currently developing called Designing for Disaster, which you'll hear more about shortly. And that is also the topic of tonight's program. Perhaps no other country in the world has such a complex and inescapable relationship with water than the Netherlands. For centuries, that country has created usable, livable land by developing methods of holding water at bay. And those experiences and that accumulated knowledge have made the Kingdom of the Netherlands virtual experts in the world of water management. We are honored to have with us this evening Dutch Ambassador Rudolf Bekink and his wife, Mrs. Bekink. Uh, the Ambassador is here to speak to us about his country's relationship to water. The Ambassador will then be followed by National Building Museum curator, Chrysanthe Broikos. Now I should note that unfortunately, the Ambassador has uh, another uh, engagement this evening, so he will need to depart directly after his remarks. I do want to thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your generous support of this program and for joining us here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador Baking. Thank you, Chase, for that introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here at this superb building, the National Building Museum. I, I don't think we have a building like that in the Netherlands. It's of a great sort of heritage um, you have. This evening we have a real Dutch treat, a Dutch-American treat actually, and the, sto and the story about how water shapes the culture, the people, and the institutions in the Netherlands. And I can think of no better t to tell that story than Tracy Metz, an American by birth, who today calls the Netherlands home. I think Tracy knows more people at the highest level of government and society on both sides of the Atlantic than anybody else. And you might know that Tracy is an accomplished author and journalist who writes for the NSA Handelsblatt, a Dutch daily newspaper in Amsterdam, which is comparable to, I would say, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, as well as the Washington Post in one go. And is an inter she's an international correspondent for the architectural record. She has published numerous articles on water management, architecture, and design. She studied architecture and design with leading minds at Harvard. And she initiated a two-year collaboration between Harvard and the Dutch government on water management and climate change. And she's also a member of the second Delta Commission, which was created by the Dutch government after Hurricane Katrina devastated Louisiana, as we, my dear friend Dale Morris at the Dutch Embassy and I witnessed the other day when we went back to New Orleans to see that still there, the devastation. Katrina caused many people in the Netherlands to wonder if the country was as safe as they believed, especially in light of a changing climate and rising sea levels. Dutch people wondered could anything like that happen to us as well? And therefore, the Dutch government created a second Delta Commission with you, Tracy, as one of the members, to answer that question, look forward, and recommend actions to keep the Netherlands safe, livable, and economically attractive for the next century. The commission advice is far-reaching. It was widely praised. You can find it actually online. Commission advice can also be summed up in layman's terms. With a modest amount of investment and foresight, the Dutch won't have to move 
to Germany in the coming decade, as Al Gore once suggested. And I was happy to see that he didn't do it again at Farin Zakaria this weekend. Tracy's experience gives us gives a, a unique perspective on how the Dutch manage water, design with water, live with water, and plan with water. She's also becoming an expert at climate adaptation challenges around the globe. Dutch experts continue to work with American friends in Louisiana, Florida, New York, California, Virginia, New Jersey, and along the mighty Mississippi. Rising seas, extreme weather, and devastating storm surge remain a focus of Dutch-American cooperation. But so too do issues of adaptation, sustainable urban design, ecosystem resiliency, and the ever-present need for ad adaptive water planning. Tracy will share with us an incredible story of how a small country in Northern Europe, mine, stood up against one of nature's most powerful forces and tamed it to become the thriving nation many of us call home, the Netherlands. And thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, and Ambassador Bakink, for joining us this evening. And I'd also like to thank you and the Embassy for your ongoing support of the museum and for this program in particular. Uh, my name is Chrysanthi Broikas. I'm a curator here at the National Building Museum. And as Chase mentioned, I'm organizing an exhibition entitled uh, Designing for Disaster. Um, it may be changed to Designing Against Disaster. Um, the exhibition will open in the spring of 2014, um, likely as we approach hurricane season. And uh, we will be looking at how planning, design, and engineering strategies can reduce the impact of natural disasters, from fires to tornadoes, and from earthquakes to storm surge. So Tracy and the Dutch uh, you know, are just focused on water. Here in the United States, um, we have many um, natural hazards that we need to focus on, and the exhibition will try to look at all of those. Um, since Cr Cr Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the National Building Museum has annually addressed issues of preparedness, risk reduction, and resiliency with public programs. And this is our first such event um, in 2013. Um, now, the ambassador really introduced you, but I'm just gonna say a few words, Tracy. Um, it is, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Um, as well as my fellow panelists uh, who will be joining us after the lecture. Uh, Tracy is a journalist and author based in the Netherlands, as you heard. Um, she writes about architecture, landscape, and urban issues for the national newspaper NRC Hendelsblatt, and is also an international correspondent for Architectural Record. Um, sh she was a, 2000, a Loeb Fellow for Harvard at, uh, in 2006 and 2007, and is the author of Sweet and Salt, Water and the Dutch. I made sure to hold that up. Um, as I'm sure you will realize, the, the, ex, uh, the book is uh, available for sale in the museum shop, and Tracy will be signing copies after the lecture. So um, you can catch her at that table right in front of the shop. Um, a few years ago, I did hear Tracy speak on this subject um, at the 2010 annual meeting of the American Planning Association in New Orleans. And now that the book is complete, I'm eager to hear more. Um, and after her talk, uh, Tracy and I will be joined on stage by Kathy Poole and Dale Morris. Uh, Kathy Poole is a registered landscape architect and principal of Poole Design a landscape architecture, ecological infrastructure, and urban design studio based in Baltimore. And Dale Morris is a senior economist and director of the Dutch government's U.S. Water Management Network. Um, along with David Wagner and the American Planning Association, Dale um, was very instrumental in organizing the Dutch Dialogue Series, an international exchange program between American and Dutch design and engineering professionals. Um, he is the ideal moderator for our discussion. Um, we are so pleased to have um, both of you join us. 
And now, uh, please help me welcome Tracy Metz. Good evening to you all. Welcome. The simple fact that there are so many of you here is not just flattering for me, but I think it's also an indication of the gravity and the importance of this subject. Uh, I've seen the public interest and the awareness of the importance of water issues grow in the years that I've been working on this subject. And um, I think it's, it's beginning to come home to all of us that this really is about us. It does affect us and it will affect us and our children even more in the future. And that whether we like it or not, we're going to have to find a way to come to terms with uh, more extreme weather, with often too much water, sometimes too little water. Uh, and what I want to talk about this evening is my experience of Dutch expertise, Dutch centuries of experience of dealing with water, and the new ways that the Dutch are now thinking, seeing this not just as a threat, but as an opportunity. If we're smart, if we're flexible and resilient and adaptable, as our surroundings should also be, then we will be able to use this water and these changing circumstances to improve the quality of our cities, the quality of our built and natural environment, to improve the landscape, and to really use this moment to recreate our surroundings in a way that in the Netherlands has been the tradition for centuries because the Dutch have had to, but in many other countries is new. So I want to give you some insights through the eyes, through my Dutch eyes, shall I say, even though I'm originally from Los Angeles, uh, and talk about what I think this could mean to us. I think nobody is thinking that the Dutch solution could be imposed one-on-one -on -one on the US or on any other place in the world. But I think what we can learn from the Dutch is um, a way of thinking and a way of layering systems and adapting. Let me show you some examples. Not long ago, the unthinkable happened. The powerhouse of the United States was struck by a tremendous storm with uh, a great loss of life, great suffering and uh, at least $50 billion worth of damage. At least that's what Congress has decided to a lot to help this. Whether it will be enough, we certainly don't know yet. But this was an inconceivable event. Remember that picture that was on the cover of New York Magazine by Yvonne Bahn, where you saw this aerial view of Manhattan with this big black swath across the middle? Who could ever have thought that the, that the heart of... of the states could be hit in this fashion. I'm sure you all saw the funny, we thought then, rather silly movie, The Day After Tomorrow. Do you remember that? Great images, but you know, that's the fun of these movies, is that you can sit there and, and be really scared in the, sh in the confidence that this is not going to happen. Oh, 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 I have to learn to deal with this, sorry. This, of course, is another image from the day of, after tomorrow with the waves rolling down through the urban canyons, people struggling through taxis, jumping from roof to roof. And then we thought, oh, isn't this a, a you know, this is science fiction. Well, not long after, it was no longer science fiction. This is the famous image of the taxi parking lot in New Jersey uh, after Sandy. All of a sudden, the unthinkable had become very, very real. This was uh, several years before, 2007, if I'm not mistaken, when the subway system had already shown how vulnerable it was to uh, flooding. But who could have imagined that this beautiful design, which is uh, in the book, uh, uh, almost fairy tale-like thought of Times Square, uh, where the neon is still working, but Times Square itself is flooded, and we move through our city in, in, in lit gondolas. I hope never to experience it, but on the one hand, it's also a beautiful vision of how different, this, different, how different a place Times Square could be. In the uh, Museum of Modern Art, a few years ago, the exhibition uh, Rising Currents was organized uh, with designs by various landscape architects 
on how to make particularly lower Manhattan more resilient uh, to storms and to high water, especially to sea level rise. This is one of those designs. I thought it was uh, a, a beautiful design in itself and a, and a wonderful idea that this city of, of skyscrapers and of piers and of the, the, the lively water's edge could become soft and fuzzy and start to merge with its natural surroundings. Little did we know when rising currents was held in the MoMA that this would suddenly become so topical. New Orleans after Katrina, one of the most poignant photos that I remember seeing of this shocking event. And uh, Katrina was, uh, strangely enough, also a wake-up call for the Dutch. Perhaps you don't realize that the Dutch don't have evacuation plans. The faith in the system is so huge, this system cannot and will not fail. The whole idea that something like this could happen in the Netherlands, it just, for us, that's the unthinkable. I never know quite whether to say us or them, so <laughs> stay with me on it. <laughs> but this image of Katrina and, and the evacuation of Katrina, um, the Dutch were really full of admiration of how the, the inhabitants of New Orleans had managed to get themselves relatively well organized and evacuate millions of people when the storm was on its way. And this for the Dutch was the start of thinking that maybe there should be evacuation plans in the Netherlands as well. When I tell this in the States, or actually anywhere else, everyone is amazed. How can you have a country where over 60% of the, brutto, the gross national product is earned below sea level in the very susceptible west of the country and not have evacuation plans? What the Netherlands needs is not uh, evacuation along the highways because many of the highways would be underwater too. What we need is vertical evacuation. You need to know where's the highest building, where can I go and just wait it out. And Katrina, I think it's interesting to see that it does work both ways. Katrina has been a wake-up call for the Netherlands and gotten them thinking about the necessity to, um, to inform the populace what to do if this should happen. Uh, interesting to note that uh, in the natural areas in the Netherlands, there are evacuation spots or high water uh, uh, safety spots for animals, but there are none for people. The assumption just is the system cannot fail. The base of the Dutch water protection system is the dike. And a dike basically, uh, the Dutch have been building dikes ever since they have lived in this uh, soggy little delta. You really wonder why anyone ever wanted to settle there in the first place. It must have been very wet. Life must have been very difficult. But um, they did, and they uh, reclaimed land by building dikes around water and then pumping the water out. It's important to realize that. It's not like, for example, in Boston, where land was created by landfill. No, that meant that the land in the Netherlands was already very low. It was already the bottom of the sea, this new, usually, uh, agricultural land that was created. And you can see here, I love this picture because you see this guy pedaling by on a nice sunny Sunday afternoon at the height of people's attics. And I think this really brings home, if the dikes were to break, and I'll show you in a moment that that has happened, then uh, what this would really mean for the land behind. And it's important to realize that, yes, the Netherlands has a very extensive and sophisticated system of dikes, but the dikes and the maintenance and the norms for the safety of the dikes have not kept speed with the amount of population living behind them and the amount of value that is created behind the dikes. So this is a continual race for the Dutch to keep up with the, um, the, the, the prosperity of the country should also be reflected in the water safety system. And it's not. Just last weekend there was a, a fascinating interview with the Dutch minister, uh, Schultz, uh, the minister of water, who said that we need to be more aware of what it means to live beneath sea level, what it takes to keep our feet dry, what it takes to protect our economy. She said, we need to have evacuation plans. And I thought this was really a clarion call to the Dutch who have sort of blissfully forgotten how uh, essential this system is to living in this country. So dikes are really 
they really shape the Dutch landscape because otherwise it's really quite a flat, rather featureless country. And dikes are important because they give the landscape shape, as you see here, and they also give you the opportunity to have a view over the surrounding countryside. And that makes them, on the one hand, they're inert, passive, boring piles of dirt. On the other hand, they are the, the shaping elements of the landscape, and they all have stories to tell if you know what to look for. This is a dike along one of the main shipping rivers in the Netherlands, and I think the way you see the, the height difference and the shape of the dike and the way it leads you towards the water, dikes are really, in a way, Dutch landscape poetry. But they don't always do what they're supposed to do. In 1953, not long after the Second World War, there had hardly been any maintenance done on the dikes because of the war. In 1953, just a couple days ago, this was 60 years ago, that the, there was a combination of uh, spring tide and a bad storm. And many of the dikes, the, in 50 different places, dikes breached in the southwest of the Netherlands. And in one night, 1,835 plus one people were killed. And just this week, with the Delta Commission, I visited the uh, Flood Museum in the south of the country. And I was finally able to ask, what is this 1835 plus one? Now I know, the plus one is a baby who was born on a raft floating in this chaotic mess on the, on the night of January 31st to February 1st. He was born on the raft and he died in his mother's arms on the raft and he never had a name. So they... Um, the 1835 plus one is a memorial for this uh, nameless victim of the flood. So many, many people were killed in one night. 720,000 people lost their homes. Over a million animals died in the flood. And of course, um, once the salt water had flooded the land, it's hard to get it out. So the damage of this salt water took months to repair. It was a huge blow for the Netherlands, so short, such a short time after the Second World War. This, I think, is one of the most poignant pictures I know of the flood. It's almost like the little cradle that Moses was found in, bobbing in the river. Seeing someone's bed floating in this, in this mass of, of cold, lonely water. And this one I also like, too, the, the sadness on the face of this woman in traditional clothing who did manage to save her pet, but perhaps nothing else. The flood, of course, was a great source of um, edifying material for a children's books. And there, was, there were huge numbers of children's books made about the, the flood and the stories of the heroism and the stories of, uh, uh, um, of course, all the wonderful things that, uh, uh, you know, really encapsulating this natural, national history and making it into something that hopefully would help the nation and not just hurt it. What was the answer to the flood of 1953? It was mainly concrete, lots and lots of concrete. The Dutch uh, embarked on a huge program to build uh, 11 different dams and sluices to shorten the coastline, thinking that if the coastline were shorter, the country would then be safer. And uh, this is one of the sluices that was then built. This is a separation. I particularly like this one because it separates uh, fresh or sweet and salt water. And I think this also is a, a great example of the tremendous innovative and uh, um, uh, uh, technical prowess of Dutch engineers. Just being able to invent a sluice like this. I've been in there and it's really exciting. When a ship comes in from the salty side, it goes in, the sluice gate's shut, and then all the salt water is sucked out from the bottom because salt water is heavier than sweet. All the water is sucked out into huge basins on the side, and then the fresh water comes in at the top, and there's this circulation pattern that's like a metamorphosis of the, of the body of water. And then when the entire lock is filled with fresh water, then the ship continue on its way. And I think the the intelligence and the, the dominion over nature that these sluices show is really uh, a symbol of the 
appro Dutch approach to water after the flood of 1953, we have power over nature. We can make water do what we want it to do. This is another one of the, the dams built after the 1953 flood, the Oosterschelde Dam. This was, uh, uh, some of the gates were left open in an attempt to keep the tide moving in and out. But in the 50 years since, we have discovered that this is not enough and that these, uh, this whole system of, of closing off all these sea arms and basins has had ecological consequences, which the country is now suffering from. This, together with climate change, is really the impetus for the new way of thinking about water management, which I will show you some examples of. This was the latest, uh, uh, the last final piece of the Delta Works. And this is a, a really very sophisticated piece of technology, perhaps moving towards the more flexible approach that the Dutch are now uh, exploring. These two arms are both as tall as the Eiffel Tower. And normally, now they're closed, but normally they're open. They lie in the river that separates, that connects Rotterdam to the sea. So only when there's a storm or the, or the seawater threatens to flood Rotterdam, do these gates close like this. It's called the Maaslandskering. And the idea is that the gates close only when necessary, so as not to interrupt shipping. The, the, the front of the gates fill with water, and then the gates sink into the river and close it off temporarily. They try not to do this unless it's really necessary, because it's very expensive. Ships can't reach Rotterdam, and it's uh, quite an... Uh, so this is the end of an era, shall we say. This is the end of the era in which the Dutch thought our future is in uh, uh, conquering the water, in keeping it out, in a defensive and technological approach. Um, this is not actually... Uh, I want to show you some examples of the new way of thinking that the Dutch are developing. This uh, uh, going from the smaller to the larger scale. First some architectural examples, then some urbanism, and then finally the larger scale of the landscape. This is not actually a water defense system, but I think it is worth showing because it's such a monument to the beauty of water and the processing of water. This is actually a water uh, purification plant. The water runs through all these various basins and then comes out clean at the end to provide drinking water for Rotterdam. And I think it's, it's significant that in 1973, when this was built, that the country was willing to spend the kind of money that was required to make something really beautiful out of water infrastructure, even though it's not a public place. You really have to jump through a lot of hoops to be able to visit this because, of course, the drinking water system is, they don't want anyone messing with that. And the fact that this was something that we wanted to invest in and a source of public pride, I think, is, is very significant. When you talk about adapting to water and living with water and, and, and building with nature, one of the developments that you often hear mentioned is uh, floating housing. And I thought this was a, a delightful design for housing, really where you see housing and, and a natural surrounding completely integrated. Some of the houses float, some of them are on stilts. And uh, I don't know if this has any chance of ever being built, but I think the uh, almost utopian approach to finding a way to design for water was something that I found really uh, appealing in this image. These houses do not float, but the photographer managed to photograph them in such a way that it looks like, like they're just landed from the moon. Actually, they're connected to the land on the back. You can just walk over a uh, a path to the houses. But when you look at them from this angle, and of course these people have wonderful views, and I think the, the, you see that architects more and more are learning to design with water, use these views. Real estate agents, of course, love being able to sell water as part of a view. Real estate agents are happy when they can sell anything nowadays. <laughs> and water is certainly an added value. These houses do float. This is the largest collection of uh, floating housing that we have in the Netherlands. It's just uh, on the edge of Amsterdam in a new area called Eiburg. And it's, uh, I think, about 75 houses, uh, quite dense, very close together. It's really like a little, a little floating village. And I asked the architect how she had solved the parking problem, because that's often an issue with floating housing. Where do you leave your car? 
And in addition to this floating development, she had also designed a series of apartments on the land, and she had just added the parking spots for the floating houses to, that, uh, to the parking contingent of the apartments. And I thought, hmm, it's really that easy. You just have to think ahead. This, of course, is, uh, is uh, uh, not something I foresee being built tomorrow, but it's a, a larger, also probably utopian concept of what a floating city could be in the water between Amsterdam and the town of uh, Almere, which is one of the new towns built in reclaimed land about 25 years ago. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure, I'm sorry that this probably won't be built, <laughs> But I wanted to show it to you anyway, because I think the fact that um, designs like this are being made which sprout from the imagination and use water to show us that we could live in an entirely new way is also part of this new way of coming to terms in design with living with water. Talking about um, redesigning the city in a way to accommodate more water, in this case, often storm water. I know one of the great problems, certainly in New York, is combined sewer overflows. The rain comes crashing down, more and more rain, harder storms, and there's so much of it at once that the sewers can't deal with it, that water comes spouting out, the manholes fly off, and the streets are flooded. So several of the uh, designs now being produced to deal with water in this new way are about water calming. You can't stop the rain, unless we stop our CO2 emissions. Uh, but what you can do is create places where we catch that water and buffer it and let it sink slowly either into the groundwater or into the sewer. And this is one of the ideas for Rotterdam. This is called a water square. And the first one is being built right now actually in Rotterdam. And the idea is that it's just a public square like any other, but then hollowed out so that it can serve as a basin when it rains. When it's dry, as you see up on the top left, you just, it's just ordinary public space. On the right, little bit of rain, little bit of water. On the left, it's full of water. You can get your little plastic dinghy out and row around. And on the right, if you're lucky and it's rained and also really cold, you might have a little skating rink. And this might look, as I said, kinky and utopian, but actually the first one is being built. The question is, of course, how many of these will you need in a city to really make a difference to the, to the water management system? But you've got to start somewhere. This is also a, an, a, an approach to accommodating water in the city in a way that is really very simple. I think that's the genius of it. The fact that it is so simple makes it replicable and intelligent. This is a canal that leads from Central Station in Rotterdam into the city, and it actually has two levels. When the water is really high, like now when it's been raining heavily, you see that there's... Uh, this is the level of the sidewalk, but when the water is lower, you see these benches, then there's another sidewalk-like way along these benches, and you can walk along the water at two levels. You can choose. And when the, it's full of water, you can't choose. Of course, you walk along the sidewalk. And when I visited this together with the uh, uh, urban designer who designed this for the city of Rotterdam, I said, well, I think you made a mistake. I said, well, look at this bridge. It just ends in the middle of the water. And he said, no, that's not a mistake. That's a very conscious measure to make people realize that you can't use this when it's wet, to make people realize that this, it's an awareness exercise. Sometimes this place is very wet and sometimes it's dry. When it's dry, you can cross. When it's wet, you can't. And just letting the bridge disappear into the water was a conscious decision on the part of the urban designers of Rotterdam to make people realize that places can change depending on the circumstances. This is the city of Hamburg, which I think also has some really smart ideas about uh, designing urban design for water. This is what they call a water square down here at the bottom. It's just a sloping, very nice public square full of amenities and benches, but designed in such a way that when the Elbe River floods and the water rushes into this old harbor basin, 
that you will able that the water can come in and then recede later and all you need to do is send in a cleaning crew to clean up the mud and the and the branches and uh, here too you see that architecture is increasingly finding answers to dealing with flexible water situations all these buildings uh, are fronted by tall let's call them baseboards and in those tall spaces you can either park or you can have a temporary use like a cafe but no one is allowed to sleep there that's the main criterion you can't sleep there so you can't be surprised in your sleep by high water and they also have a system of uh, raised walkways here and uh, the whole design of this former harbor neighborhood of Hamburg is designed to to still that the city can still function when the water is high. This is, uh, I think, one of the most, the, one of the loveliest designs I've seen in the city of Copenhagen. It's so simple. What is it really? It's just a, it's just, just a raft. But by putting this in the water, and this is actually the harbor of Copenhagen, which has become so clean that you can swim in this water and, uh, and drink it, that you make a, a public amenity with just a very simple measure, make a, a public swimming pool in water that's already there. And uh, it's very popular. I've seen it in use in the summer. You can see on the photograph, even though it's far away, that it's busy. And uh, uh, you can make the water situation fun. This is also an idea for something similar in, uh, in New York. There's an idea for a floating pool in uh, uh, floating uh, swimming pool in the East River. And I think this is a, a delightful idea, and I really do hope that, uh, that this gets realized. Coming back briefly to the dikes, this is a new idea for a new kind of dike in the Netherlands. Uh, no longer this passive pile of dirt, as I said disrespectfully, but a multifunctional dike where you use uh, uh, urban spaces, urban design, the, the functions that we need in daily life uh, combined with water safety measures. So we have the dike, which protects the city from the water. And then you also have, for example, here you have a park. Here you have roads. Here you have uh, another park. And you can also build on these dikes. Dikes are no longer standalone lonely, empty objects. They are now becoming incorporated into uh, city life and city functions. And that gives them a new lease on life and makes them part of, brings them back into the ken of civilization, shall I say. One of the most beautiful examples in the Netherlands is the town of Scheveningen, which is a fishing village near The Hague. And they have redesigned their boulevard in a way that the dike is inside the boulevard and then the boulevard is folded over the dike, as it were, moving down into the, into the beach. Uh, this is the dike on the inside. It's like a candy bar with a soft filling on the inside, except the soft filling here is not that soft. This is a very sturdy sea dike, the biggest kind that we have. And then on the top, you see the various paths for cars, cyclists, pedestrians, and then here on the bottom right, you see the uh, new entrance to the beach. And I think this is really a good example of the new Dutch approach is incorporating uh, water measures into uh, the design of our daily surroundings. And this is the boulevard with the new lighting and new paving, and it's become a tremendous public success. Super dike. We're starting a new kind of dike here. Uh, this is actually an idea that came from Japan where because of the earthquakes, dikes can't be tall and, and, and thin. They have to be low and very wide. So this is a Dutch version of a Japanese super dike. And the idea of these designers, the same designers who designed the water square, was that you could build a public swimming pool in the dike. In this case, the sw swimming pool that they hoped to build for the Olympics of 2028 when the Netherlands was still considering opting for those Olympics 100 years after we had the Olympics in 1928. Government has now decided to, to scrap this uh, effort, but I think the idea that you can use these dikes to incorporate large public amenities like this, you see we're ratcheting up this whole process of 
making our dikes do more for us. The Dutch have discovered in recent years that the most urgent threat doesn't come from the sea. Sea water rises gradually. The most urgent threat comes from the rivers because as the river water comes rushing down from the Alps, uh, the discharge of the rivers is uh, gradually increasing. And the rivers have been, just like the Mississippi, have been tightened into troughs, very efficient for shipping, but there's nowhere for the water to go. The system is completely inflexible. So now the Dutch have started a, a huge national program, two billion euros, called Room for the River. And this is one of the examples of Room for the River, where you see that along this river, the Waal, near the town of Nijmegen, well known from uh, A Bridge Too Far, that the option here is to add a new arm to the river. And when, this, when the river water is too high, the, this new branch will fill. When the river is not high, the branch will fall dry. And this has also created opportunities for a lovely new uh, uh, urban area on this island. Uh, and it's um, really a stimulus for the development of the town of Nijmegen. Well, it's all about catching our water, slowing it down, and using it to create a new landscape. This is a water buffer area in the east of the country near the town of Omelo. And I really like this because I think you see very well, at the, on the one hand, with the meanders. It's obviously uh, the, the, the design language of a river, but it's also very clearly designed by human hand. And that combination of um, water, recognizable water shapes and movement, but then with a human design, is perhaps all what Dutch, Dutch design with water is about now. And uh, as you can see, of course, these meanders and these green dishes, it has to be very clean cut for the design to really speak to us. And uh, when I was there, it was it progressed along, and it was getting a little grown over. And I said, well, how do you manage to keep this place looking nice and sharp? And they said, well, when it starts to get too fuzzy, what we do is we rent some sheep. <laughs> I said, you what? You rent sheep? Yes, rent a sheep. They have, there are farmers who now do this as an extra source of income. They rent sheep. So they cart these sheep into this uh, uh, water buffer area, and they let them uh, nibble their way around for about three or four days, and then everything's cleaned up again. And I said, you know, this sounds like so much extra work. Why don't you just let the sheep live there? And the designer said, well, we don't really want that because sheep are very much animals of habit. They tend to sort of cuddle down and make little hollows for themselves. And they, they, they carve out paths for themselves. And they always follow the same paths, just like humans. They have desire lines. Uh, and the designer, of course, didn't want the sheep adding their sheepy design to his <laughs> human design, and I thought, isn't this interesting? Who, who's the designer here? <laughs> One of the last large scale, perhaps the largest innovation that I wanted to tell you about is the sand engine off the coast near The Hague. This basically is just a huge pile of sand, 21 million cubic meters, that was uh, dredged up from the bottom of the North Sea and dumped here off the coast in a very specific design, designed in such a way that the natural currents along the coast would pick up this sand and move it up and down the coast in such a way that it would no longer be necessary to nourish the beaches every year. The idea is A, that this is cheaper if you do it just all at once, and B, that you intervene less in the ecosystem of the, of the, of the coast if you let nature decide where to take the sand. And I said, well, how do you know that nature is going to do what we want it to do. Maybe nature just picks all this sand up and puts it back in the North Sea. And uh, uh, it is an experiment. It's going to be an experiment for a period of 20 years. And they are monitoring this very closely to see where the sand is going and if it really is indeed nourishing the beaches. But it has become a hugely popular uh, new kind of natural area. The people around The Hague, they love it. And you know who really loves it are the surfers and the kite surfers. They think this is just the greatest thing because apparently this, is, this intervention has changed the kinds of waves that, that roll in here. And uh, it's full of surfers and kite surfers. And I interviewed one of them for the book, 
professional surfer, uh, Michael Schmitz, and he said, oh, I think this is just the greatest thing. I hope we get another 10 of these. Changing the landscape around like this, you know, there's not, there's no place in Holland where nobody lives. Someone is always going to be affected. And I spoke to this farmer. He lives in uh, one of these uh, agricultural polder areas, reclaimed land, called the Noordwaard. And he, in the flood of 1953, he told me, he hung from, by his fingernails from the roof of his farmhouse. Uh, uh, family was killed in the flood. He really knew what the flood meant. And trying to tell this man that it might be safer to lower the dikes than to raise them, he is not having it. He said, they promised us cows with golden horns if we would leave and let the water back in. And he said, I just, we don't believe in that water. And I thought, isn't that, it's so I, understandable for this generation, but at the same time I thought, is water that's something you can really believe in or not? But he didn't believe that, that this approach of taking the pressure off, lowering the dike so that the water could flow through his polder. This fellow lives right here. So he just managed to escape having to either be uh, uh, bought out or, or move. But um, I just wanted to tell you this to show that, that um, not everyone is convinced that this is the way to go, and especially when it really does affect people who have to leave. And you could also say, I think probably in America we would say, well, you can stay as long as you realize that you're not safe. If the water comes through your area, then, you know, we're not here for you. You decided to stay. But in Holland, safety is such a, uh, uh, just like water, such a collective thing that the government could not say to people, you can stay and then fend for yourselves because people won't fend for themselves. They'll, they'll, they'll want to be rescued. They'll be upset. They'll, they'll, they'll claim the damage. And so all the people who live in the path of the water have had to, to leave. That also happened with this uh, farmer's family in an area in the uh, south of the country. There was, uh, there's also an agricultural area where, they, where the government decided that they needed to take the pressure off the rivers by lowering the dikes and letting this area flood every now and then, creating a spillway, basically. And this was the only instance I know in the Netherlands where the people who lived there banded together and they said, well, we understand that this has to happen, and we can say no, we can fight it all the way to court and back, but we'll probably lose in the long run, and why don't we band together and, and see if we can find a solution? And they did. The north of their area is going, the dikes are going to be lowered. On the south, they have uh, built mounds for the new farms, and I just visited uh, this farmer recently together with uh, Michael Kimmelman from the New York Times. And the mounds have been built. They had just moved in two weeks before. And I think this is a fascinating example of how this new dealing with water, letting the water in, you see that um, this is a high water image. This, their farms are surrounded by water, both on the outside of the dike and the inside. But they can continue to farm without disturbance on these mounds. And isn't it interesting that innovation really consists of going back to something which the very earliest Dutch settlers built in the 1100s, mounds. So, plus ça change, plus ça reste la même chose. This is my last image. I want to leave you with this and just make some final remarks. This is the American way. This is my farm. I'm going to get out my bulldozer and I'm going to build my dike around my farm. And I think it, this really says a lot about um, the fact that water is not here experienced as a collective issue. This farmer is just saving himself. And of course, right he is to do so. This is a farm in uh, uh, Vicksburg in Mississippi. And of course, this is the Mississippi River. But I think that really is one of the two main differences between Dutch culture and American culture with regards to, to risk. Uh, the Dutch very strongly perceive water as a collective issue. Safety, uh, uh, um, 
uh, irrigation water, drinking water. Of course, the country is small, and everything can be resolved as a collective issue. We pay taxes for it, and we expect government to take care of it for us. Um, of course, we have then forgotten what it takes to do that, as I said in the beginning. But there's a strong sense of this being a collective issue. And I think another very important difference in the mentality of the two countries is that the Dutch are very much geared to prevention. We invest hugely. We invest uh, about a billion euros a year, 1% of the GDP, in prevention. And I know that this was always found to be rather strange in the US where things happen and then you repair it. That's a whole different mentality. But when you see that uh, the damage of Sandy is creeping up towards 50 billion or more, then we start to do the math. And I think that now in the US, we're also thinking much more about, wouldn't we uh, have better spent that 50 billion on prevention uh, instead of reparation after the fact? I think there's also some interesting uh, uh, governance issues here. Uh, the Delta Commission that I was a member of, as the ambassador so kindly mentioned, uh, set up three things which I think are unthinkable here, but they do say a lot about the, the Dutch approach. One of the things that the commission recommended was the uh, setting up of a Delta fund. And as of 2020, the Dutch government will be putting 800 million euros a year in this fund for prevention in the future without a disaster having happened. And I think this is an extraordinary testimony to the forward thinking of the Dutch, to this mentality of prevention, that such a large amount of money would be put into a fund for which there is no immediate use, just knowing that there are going to be issues with climate change as the population and the wealth behind the dikes increases, that we're going to have to do expensive things and that we'd better start filling our piggy bank right now. Uh, we also uh, urge that the Dutch government uh, set up a, a functionary called the Delta Commissioner. He has the uh, authority of a minister, but he is, it is not a political appointment. So there is someone at the highest level of government who is in charge of water affairs. And uh, I think many people in New York, I've talked to many people in New York who suffered through Sandy and said, oh, wish we had someone like Secretary of HUD or someone at, at a high government level who could um, defend the interests of water because it, it like water itself, it, it knows no boundaries. It crosses all the boundaries. And I think that uh, uh, American government could profit by having someone with this kind of uh, authority. And we also suggested that there be a new Delta law, putting all these things that I've just mentioned into law. And this has indeed happened. So I think that's really quite commendable. Often when I come to the US, and I'm, I'd like to round up with just a couple elements of this major paradigm shift that I've been telling you about, the Dutch are not scared. They're not even really aware. Most people don't know how high or low the water would be, whether their house would be flooded or not in the case of a disaster. Responsibility for water safety has been outsourced to the government, to the engineers, to the water boards, and that's a privilege in a way, to not to have to be aware and not to have to be scared all the time. On the other hand, I think that uh, it's very true what uh, Mr. Schultz said in that interview last weekend in the paper, that we should be more aware of where we live and what it takes to be able to live the way we do, and that there are no evacuation plans. People don't know what to do in the case of a disaster. There's also no policy for a shortage of fresh water. The Dutch have always had much too much fresh water. They needed to get rid of it, pump it out, out to sea. And now, as the climate's changing and the vagaries of hot and cold, um, also the Dutch are starting to realize that fresh water is an incredibly valuable resource and are starting to think of a policy. What are we going to do in case of drought? Something that was never on the Dutch agenda at all. There's no flood insurance in the Netherlands. There is, if something really, if major disaster really hit, there is not a single insurance company that could bear that burden of this, of such a, a large scale national disaster. At the same time, government feels that government can't bear that burden either any longer. So this is an issue that's up for grabs in the Netherlands. 
Who's going to fix it if and when it happens? And as I said, the, uh, the dikes have not kept up with the uh, growth of the number of people living behind them and the value generated there. So uh, there is a lot of uh, maintenance that needs to be done. And as we all know, which politician likes to profile himself on an election ticket as maintenance? I, do, I have heard of a heartening example. I think it was in the city of Atlanta where there was a lot of trouble with the sewers. And there was a woman running for mayor and she profiled herself as the sewer girl. And she said, this is an issue here. It's going to take money. Nobody can see it. It's below the ground. It's not sexy. It's not exciting, but it does have to happen and we will all benefit. And I really admire the courage of a politician like this to stand up and say, uh, maintenance of the dikes is not the hottest issue, even in the Netherlands. But I think it's, it's uh, laudable that there are politicians like this who stand up and say, this will benefit us all for, for ourselves and also for our children. Let's look at the long term and do what needs to be done. And I hope I've shown you examples that uh, prove that by doing what needs to be done, we can improve our cities and improve our landscape and our nature and live in a more natural fashion with nature and with water rather than fighting it. That's the new Dutch way of thinking and I think we can all learn something from it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is my mic on? Yep. Good. Okay. Uh, welcome. My name is Dale Morris, senior economist at the Netherlands Embassy. I have an accent from Pittsburgh, so I'm not Dutch. Um, <laughs> and Pittsburgh plays Baltimore, so I couldn't root for Baltimore last night. But anyway, okay. <laughs> so, Tracy wrote an amazing book. Uh, collaboration with a lot of the very people that I work with on a daily basis or a weekly basis from the Netherlands trying to teach Americans show Americans and help Americans understand how to live with water. Um, Tracy didn't go into it. Uh, the Netherlands has a water problem, and in the future they're going to have a shortage of water problem. And Tracy explains it very much in this book. The, the landscape is changing. Rising seas are driving, is driving salt into the delta, which is changing the ecosystem, changing fresh water supply, and changing how the Dutch grow produce and those famous flower bulbs we all like to buy from them, uh, it's going to change that. And if they don't deal with that well, their economy's in trouble. Um, and that's part of my job, is to help the Netherlands and Americans collaborate. A um, couple things. Uh, I find it quite odd that the Americans, or the Dutch have chosen two Americans to tell part of their story here. That's what I do, help with water. Um, we're working in New York, New Jersey, California, Florida, all around the United States, trying to find this collaboration. It is a partnership. The Dutch are learning from the United States. There's some great innovation occurring in this country. Um, the Dutch have learned a lot on emergency response and, and evacuations from the Americans, certainly in Louisiana, and the Dutch are helping here. Um, the Netherlands has a water problem, and I think it's important to realize this. It is a man-made problem. They have chosen to live in this environment. If they didn't want this water problem, they could just move, but it's a very productive, it's a very uh, uh, interesting landscape to live in, very productive. The Dutch have traded around the world because of this water, but they could move, uh, but they don't want to, and so that requires good planning and good innovation, and Tracy showed some of this. One of the big differences that I think most Americans should understand when they're looking at the, at the United States water challenge, challenges, certainly in the Gulf and on the East Coast of the United States, the Netherlands has a pretty easy problem to solve with water, with storm surge, because the weather is rather tame. The, the rain comes down in millimeters per hour, not inches per hour. It's a rather tame environment. Wind speeds, maximum wind speeds in the Netherlands are the equivalent of a Category 2 or 2-plus hurricane. So the United States has a different challenge to deal with water. And finally, before I go to my question here, it's, it's interesting to note that most Americans think of the, of the Netherlands and the Dutch people um, wooden shoes and good cheese, um, windmills and things like that. And what the Dutch don't do very well um, is they don't boast about how good they are at certain things. 
what does it mean to be Dutch? Um, the Dutch are not very nationalist. Tracy and I can laugh mm -hmm. at this, but if you've ever been, if you've ever seen World Cup soccer or speed skating, there's nothing but our orange around the audience at that time. So the Dutch are very proud of themselves in certain things, and they're not proud of themselves enough when it comes to urban planning and landscape architecture. They are perhaps the best in the world when it comes to this. So good in this, in fact, is that the American Planning Association and the National Building Museum has asked my former boss, uh, the previous Netherlands ambassador to the United States, to do the L'Enfant Lecture in the Netherlands this coming May, and you may hear more about that in the future. So the Dutch are very good at this. And now I'm gonna pose a question to Kathy. Um, Kathy, are the Dutch really this good? <laughs> are they? <laughs> You have a unique background. Your biography speaks for itself. It is a tremendous background. You deal with water, you deal with landscape. Are they that good? Or are they just fortunate to live in an environment that requires them to be innovative and they have an institutional setting in the Netherlands that allows them to innovate and allows them to, exp to experiment and allows them to adapt? Yes. <laughs> no. And okay, why? Um, okay. so. When we talked earlier, uh, the question was a little bit different. Um, so I'm sitting here trying to <laughs> shift my answer. Um, the question was more about the uniqueness. I mean, yes, they're that good, but they're not the only ones who are that good. And it's good how, I, I think is the question. Sorry, I should be looking at you um, and not him. I mean, I think that on the one hand, yes, you, you have this sort of wonderful condition, but our conditions are just different. So I, I guess I would say, you know, yes, um, I mean, no, you're not unique and no, you're not so wonderful in one sense that you have an imperative, you had no choice. You had no choice but to deal with this. Um, I think what we're not recognizing where we're not being as good um, as you is that we're not recognizing that we don't have a choice either. Um, and that we are just really slow on the uptake, I guess, in a sense, because we haven't had to face it. Um, and I, I wrote down some reasons of w what are our problems? You know, why can't we, be, and I was thinking mainly of us, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about others who I think are just as good in a way. Um, and the book does this really beautifully, um, and, and Tracy just didn't have time to talk about this, but it's about how water is just not part of our national imagination. It's just not. Y you know, and it is so key, it's mythic, you know, to the Dutch sense of imagination. So we don't have that touchstone, we don't have that thing to go back to, so I think that limits our ability to be as good. And, and I'll go through these really quickly. We have tons of land, um, or at least we think we do, so we don't have that imperative yet. I'll get there. Um, we have a loan and finance structure as a practicing professional who half my world is in institutional and half of it's in developer world. You know, so uh, in my developer world, you know, they've got five years, they've got to get in, they've got to get out. And so this kind of innovation that the Dutch have been able to pursue for centuries, um, and that is the foundation of, you know, the book also did this very beautifully, the foundation of your democracy, you know, this whole Polder and Dyke system, we have no sense of. So it really limits our ability to uh, pursue these visionary projects. Um, as a practicing professionals, we have layers of bureaucratic institutions and organizations who do not always coordinate with one another and have varying levels of competency within them. Okay, I said it. <laughs> I'll take the consequences, but it's true. We I have mean, those too. Well, <laughs> I know that they're the bane of my existence. I mean, I, I could give you examples, but I probably should stay out of that trouble. Um, but, you know, you have water with this institution and water with that one, and they're not talking to each other, and these, the purposes and the regulations I have to meet with this are absolutely counter to the ones with this. So, that's a problem. And so we have to solve this if we're ever going to be as good. We're just never going to be as good unless we solve that one, and that one's a huge one. Um, we are spoiled, and we are not willing to give up things. Um, this occurred to me while you were talking, and the example is in the book about how uh, the designer solved the parking for the floating houses. And we're not gonna walk that far. If I try and sell that to my developer, that, no, no, we don't have to have the garage in there. It can be, you know, you know, just, oh, I don't know, 50 feet over here. 
I, I'll lose the job. I mean, you know, so it's, and I can keep pushing it, but so we are spoiled and we're not willing to give up some of these private rights. I mean, just, just if, our democ if your democracy is built on polders and dikes and a collectiveness, ours is built on individual property rights. So somehow or other, we've got to get it to some kind of metropolitan council, some kind of larger governing, whether it's a czar, a, like a drug czar, or, or something like that. I think it'll probably be something lower than that that builds to that, but anyhow. Um, and we lack political courage, except for perhaps New York Governor Cuomo um, today, if y'all read the news about he's willing to stick his neck out there. We'll see what happens with that. I don't want to sidetrack that. Um, the other thing that I think is a huge, huge um, limit to our creativity, and I'm saying this for all landscape architects and architects and urban planners and designers everywhere, we have health regulations in this country about um, public water that are monumentally difficult uh, in terms of reaching anything like the Dutch or these proposals for these projects. In terms of, and, and very specifically, I'll, I'll back into this, you, get, you guys are DCers. What's up with American history and the fountains? Y'all know, y'all know, you can't touch the fountains. They have those guardrails up around them. That's because it has, that water would have to be, they're a client. Um, that water would have to be brought up to swimming pool standards for the public to be able to touch the water. So we can't use any, I mean, I, we have all these great ideas for stormwater, um, but we can't implement them because of health regulations. And this is a huge limit to our creativity. All right, I know, I'm taking up too much time. Okay, yes, there are other people who have been just as creative, and my favorite is still Curitiba, Brazil, where, and this is a terrestrial system, it's one more like ours, it's not one where they're in the middle of all this water. It is different, they have torrents of water coming down, but they redesigned a city, redesigned an entire stormwater system, redesigned a social system, redesigned a housing system, that all was predicated on water and dealing with that water. And to me, they are still the examples outside of the Netherlands, mm -hmm. of what the rest of us can do that are not trying to hold back a sea, uh, that are dealing with overland water. Okay, so, one more minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, they invited me. Um, so, so what needs to, what are the big things though? I just said all these little problems and all these kind of little steps, but what are the big things? We, don't, we have got to figure out how to deal with water and see water as an infrastructure. Hmm. We deal with it in these little teeny bits and the only people who seem to know how to see it as the Dutch see it, it seems to me, are farmers. You know, farmers see it as infrastructure. They understand the whole system and they have this system view where we don't see the system at all. We want to turn on the water and here it comes and we don't understand all the consequences. Well, that's a whole nother five different talks. Um, but the other thing is, I think that until, until we understand that water is directly related to our security, and I don't mean necessarily national security, but to our security, as in freedom from fear, I know you talked about it in a different way, it's gonna be very difficult for us to have the political will, the, the personal connections to then find the ways to exercise the same creativity and success that the Dutch have had. And eventually it will be a national security issue. I mean, as you know, our growing seasons are shorter and our crop yield is less and we end up with water negotiations with Mexico that are gonna be a real problem when we start to have to fight for resources because of ice sheets in the way or melting that's getting in the way of getting to particular minerals, then we'll start to address it. Right. It would be nice if we could start sooner right. than that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank well, you. Very well, impassioned well. and uh, comprehensive overview there. Um, one of the things that I would say from my experience, and I I'm sure Tracy shares this, is the institutional setting in the United States, because the U.S. is so, la so large, the interests are so diverse, um, yeah. and the political structure of federalism does not allow the collaboration that even if the Netherlands, they have their similar fights, they're not nearly as extensive. And uh, the water threat is a threat to the entire country in the Netherlands, and it is in the United States. Yeah. So, um, but very good. Um, so, Crisanti, um, the exhibit, Designing for Disasters or Designing Against Disasters, um, uh, a change perhaps. Yeah. Um, 
we can design to mitigate and we can design to adapt. The climate change and the ri rising seas are really putting a lot of iconic and very crucial American cities at st uh, you know, in jeopardy. We saw it three months ago in New York. Uh, Norfolk, many people don't know this, is the city with the highest uh, flood risk in the eastern United States. And if it floods there and there is something bad happening elsewhere in the world that the Navy needs to get to, the Navy can't leave Norfolk. Sacramento in the Central Valley of California has a higher flood risk today than does New Orleans before Katrina. Uh, Miami, uh, Houston, there's all these cities in the United States, Chicago, places along the Mississippi, a lot of flood risks. So can we design for this or do we just give up and do what Mayor Cuomo, or sorry, uh, Governor Cuomo proposed today in New York, I don't know if you saw this, $400 million to buy people out so they don't rebuild along the U.S. coast. So can we design or do we retreat? I think we have to do both. Um, I, I mean, in many places, um, even th there wouldn't be any political will to move. Mm -hmm. um, so, and in, in some places, uh, economically, I don't think we would be able um, to give up. Uh, so I think we, we can learn a lot from the Dutch and seeing that you know you can you can build and design um, And I think we're getting a little bit smarter about that. We've, we've got a little bit of the wake-up call I think we have a long way to go um, And in other places, I think it does take the political will to I mean we do have examples of towns uh, Along the Mississippi River for example um, who have moved you know after the residents themselves um, who have who have repeatedly um, seen the losses, and this was after Katrina as well, when, when, when um, part of the um, building in the aftermath series that we had here uh, was looking at the um, alternative housing solutions um, to, the, to the trailers, right? And, these, um, and, and some communities actually said, we don't want to go back there. If we're going to do this, we want to go to higher ground. We're, you know, we're not interested in the short term. We're interested in a long-term solution. Um, we've seen it in Greensburg, Kansas, right after uh, the devastation there. That the people will get together and say, "No, we're going to. We're not going to just rebuild. We're going to rebuild better." Um, so I think, you know, part of the what the exhibit wants to do is is bring some of those examples to the fore and show that we, you know, many of us around the country are thinking about these things. Um, but a lot of times we don't know it, and, a lot, and the country's so big, um, we're we're not finding those solutions, or we're not realizing how everything is affecting everything else, and that's really one of the other issues that the the show um, hope, hopes to address. Um, I've learned just in the last two weeks about some really innovative um, zoning that's going on in South Florida as well, um, where why is it, for example, that an, an entire county that may be 50 square meters or um, has you know, zoning throughout it the same. Why, if you're in a high risk area, wouldn't the zoning there be slightly different and the building requirements in that location be better, right, or stronger? But we don't have that currently. But there, there's experimentation going on now with, you know, if you're in a very high risk area, then the, you know, the code that you have to build to there is gonna be different. Um, not, not just the, the, the code for the entire county. Um, so I do think that there are some um, positive examples so right what, here. What you're saying then is really is the, the design profession is going to be crucial for the future. So Kathy, that sounds like job security for all of you <laughs> students. Uh, that sounds pretty good too. Um, you need the political will, um, and often that doesn't exist in such a large country as the United States. The people in Oregon really don't care a whole lot about what happened in New York um, because the country is so large. And so that's a, a challenge that we face in the United States. Um, and the but Dutch are, don't Dale, have There are yes. a lot of measures already in place, which we just till now have ignored. <coughs> uh, uh, New York has really uh, quite some strict and sensible zoning laws, mm -hmm. but nobody really felt that it was that important to adhere to them. <coughs> and now I think Sandy, of course, in many ways has been a wake-up call. And uh, I think if we start doing a lot of the things that we should have been doing already and w for which legislation is already in place, 
we will have already helped a lot. Whether uh, some of this relief money will go, for example, to retrofitting all the existing building stock, yeah. that is another huge issue. Right. Huge, huge. Just taking all the uh, servers and all the electrical equipment out of the basement and trying to put it somewhere else mm -hmm. in a building. Uh, just to do that to a, a, a city with as many buildings as Manhattan and New Jersey and Brooklyn have is, is the undoable task. Right. But that's interesting. You mentioned um, so Hurricane Sandy and its impact. Um, I don't know if most of you, some of you in the audience follow what the Dutch do. So right after Hurricane Sandy, everyone kept pointing to the Dutch need, saying, well, the Dutch need to come and build a few barriers. Of course, my engineering, my Dutch engineering company friends love that idea. <laughs> um, $17 billion kind of project, they absolutely love the idea. But it wasn't the Dutch that were promoting this, it was people looking for a sort of a, a solution. And what the Americans don't realize is the Delta Works, as Tracy mentioned, took 40 years to build out. 19, 1957 until 1997, so it's a long-term investment. Um, and what we have been, we're cooperating with folks from New York and New Jersey right now, and we're showing them there has to be a lot of different measures that are layered, green infrastructure as well as gray infrastructure, innovative planning as well as managed retreat. It has to be a number of different things so the, so the environment adapts. Um, so I want to turn the questions over to the audience. Who has the questions for Tracy or the other two panelists, Kathy or Kusante? Wait for the microphone, please. Someone's running right up now. My question is about the federal regulation. You said that there is no law. There is. There is a flood plain requirement, flood plain and flood ways requirement. Flood way you cannot build. Flood plain you have to build everything one and a half foot above. Mm -hmm. And I'm, for a long time, I was very curious that the that, uh, flood plain requirement rather encouraged to build. Because as long as you build on that standard, you can build it and you can get the flood insurance from the federal government. So I was thinking it's probably in some point that idea has to be changed. But on the other side, not everybody can move up right. to the higher ground. So I'm very curious that how it's going to be resolved. Yeah. Do you want to take the question? Yeah, I mean, definitely the, um, the federal government has subsidized you know, building in the floodplain. There's no doubt about that. Um, and, I, and I think that's, uh, uh, I mean, a debate. I, w I wish it were a public debate. You know, right now it's, it's really not. But, but between what's been going on recently, I think these issues are coming to the fore. I mean, I think that's going to be looked at. Now, the, there has been, um, you know, last summer, the new flood insurance um, program was reformed somewhat. Um, and uh, as you heard mentioned earlier, um, Governor Cuomo today came out with a proposal where, you know, these repetitive lost properties in the floodplain, um, they, they, you know, they should, they should not be there, right? They just shouldn't be there. We've, we, we've what is it, we, you know, shame on me, you, right. know, you know, once but, or twice, but three times. It is, to my mind, I think it's, it's unfortunate that we continue to pay and we continue um, when it's, when it's right. you know, it, Tracy, it's not in, smart. In the Netherlands, the Room for the River program, as you mentioned, underway, um, the Netherlands is the third most densely populated country in the world. Um, people forget that. So landscape is uh, very expensive and very um, protected. People like to occupy land in the Netherlands. They don't like to have too much water. But the Room for the River has changed that because they had two one in 300 year floods in a three year period in the 1990s. So they realized, well, something's changing, so they're giving space back to the water. And as Tracy showed, this is creating innovation in design and creating new ways of uh, having mixed use retail and, and, and mixed urban development. It's no, it's no uh, uh, coincidence, though, mm -hmm. that some of these uh, agricultural areas where they've decided to make more room for the river are some of the most uh, thinly populated mm -hmm. areas in the countryside. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, fewer people that have to move or be bought out is less expense and less mm -hmm. uh, litigation. So there's, uh, there is a certain element of uh, pragmatic uh, opportunism here. Right. 
Uh, interesting aside, two uh, years ago we were we were pulled out into uh, into the Mississippi region because of the Mississippi floods, major major floods. You all remember that three or four months long. We were pulled out there to thought, do a room for the river workshop, um, and we're going to have that in March, a couple about a month and a half from now. And the problem is too little water in the river. It's drought. So our topic may have to change. Anyway, um, any questions? Uh, more questions? There's one in the back, please. My question has to do with development in urban environments. When one looks at New York City and its movement toward 300, 400 square foot residences and apartments, um, increasingly it is predicated on a lifestyle mm -hmm. in which very little takes place other than sleeping <laughs> and playing with your electronics in your residence. So even as we build up to avoid the problem, if there is flooding, it's not a one-day flood. So how do we deal with the fact that all of the services that people will look for will have gone away because of our movement toward a much, much smaller profile or footprint in the housing than we've had? And I'm concerned as a DC resident, since the model seems to be whatever New York does, DC does. <laughs> I'll give that question to Kathy. I think it's right up. Uh a design professional's line. Well, my immediate response is, well, my 17-year-old daughter's idea, it, it, it comes just spouting out of her every once in a while, why can't this car fly? Um, and so that's the flip answer. But the serious answer is, oh gosh, the first one is, I don't know. I mean, I think that, but what I do know is, is what I hope my profession, and I mean, when I say my profession, I'm talking about the design profession, not just landscape architects, um, is that, you know, that may be, not be something we're facing right now, but what I'm, I see a real dearth of, oh, this is how we are alike, the Dutch and we, and everyone else, is there are very few professionals who are looking at this idea of change. You know, we, we can design the dike with the houses on it, these really cool things, these you know, escarpments that go down. But what about, or, or we can design for nature, which is different than designing for ecology. But we can do that for now. But what about for when the sea level is one foot up and three feet up? Or what about when we're gonna have a shorter growing season? What are we gonna do then? So to me, that's, that's part of this issue of we should be figuring out how not only to design differently, but how are those designs going to adapt over time as changing, as climates change, or for that matter, as economies change? You know, the, what are the contingencies? How can we make a malleable kind of design? So, because to me, when we're starting to talk about, you're going to trap me in 300 square feet for how long, um, you know, then you'd better have some contingency plans for me and there needs to be some adaptability in that. So I don't have an answer for what that is, but I do know that that is the way, at least I believe, you, know, you were talking for yourself, this is me, um, we need to start designing differently. We need to start thinking about, well, what are the contingencies? What are the changes over time? And this is somebody who thinks about ecology a lot, right? And so that's my model and our ecologies are gonna change, so we better figure out how to design with these, e these changing ecologies over time. But those same models work for social patterns, for living patterns, for building patterns. And I'm not talking about some biomimicry thing, I have real problems with that. <laughs> um, but, but the principles of designing for change over time, and, and that is way, the way I would hope we would approach answering your question which I know didn't really answer your question. But that, I mean, but we have to have strategies. I mean, we're talking about strategies here and examples of, of new strategies. And so that's, I think that's where we need to spend a lot of time thinking. You know, we, we tend to get really uppity about, you know, think tanks and people who just think all the time because we're just such pragmatists in this country, um, which is great. Um, but unless we think about the strategies more and get really serious about those, I'm not sure we'll be able to affect those kind of changes that'll be able to handle those answers and a gazillion more questions like them. Right. So I think we have we have time for one more question, but um, you just you just encourage me to use a little bit of a segue to that question. So people thinking about these topics of adaptation and tipping points. So when do you make your investments? So 
you don't do it too early and waste money and too late to waste more money. Um, I'm going to give you two examples. There's a wonderful think tank uh, in Tacoma, Washington called Earth Economics. You can look them up online, eartheconomics.org, I think, or .com. They're leading the, the cutting edge research on this very topic. Mm -hmm. How do you value ecosystems? How do you value nature? You value ecology? And then how do you make your investments so that we can use the resilience that that provides? Mm -hmm. And then the favorite Dutch uh, research institute, Deltaris, uh, deltaris.nl, I think, or dot com. 800 person strong group of super smart people, multidisciplinary, also trying to struggle with this very question. So if this topic interests you, you can go to the, your favorite American site, your favorite Dutch site, and learn a lot. Anyone have a final question? Yeah, there's one. Thank you. So in our... Um cities especially, we seem to uh, have a tendency to centralize our infrastructure, both for power and water and you know sewage treatment and everything is piped to some one spot like Blue Plains where it's treated. And, uh, and I guess one question I have um, as a designer is trying to figure out whether decentralizing uh, these infrastructures is a good idea or a bad idea in, in the long run in terms of how you know, it's going to be, uh, whether it's going to make us um, safer and make the uh, systems more resilient. Who's going to take that? Oh, one? I'll take a crack at it. <laughs> All right. I think that we're going to have to have both. And we're going to have to have some, I imagine, some third system that I don't even know what that is. You know, uh, I, I would hope there's something I can't think of. There better be. Um, and no, I mean, seriously, because we, we haven't we learned that we can't have, you know, okay, let's just go to national defense. We want to put it in one place where it can get to get knocked out. I mean, so I think we have learned. I, I really honestly believe that as a nation, we're starting to figure out we'd better rethink this whole, I don't know what the mentality, this 50s, you know, mentality of centralizing everything. But I don't think the answer is dispersing everything either because there are some things you just can't do that well. And what are uh, one of them? I'll give you a real concrete, quick, concrete example. I live in Maryland. I have to submit my things to the Maryland Department of Environment for stormwater regulation review all the time. And, you know, there's such a, in the new regulations, it's all about, you know, dispersing, you know, getting the water where it falls, having it as dispersed as possible. And I have a constant argument with them that it, sometimes it's better to do the engineering thing and to centralize it for a million reasons, whether it's land value, the economics of it, or it's the ecology. But there's this presumption that, you know, one, this dispersal is the best way to do it. So I know from personal experience in water, at least on small, medium, and pretty large scale, sometimes that's not the solution it's sometimes better to centralize. So I think it's going to be both. And then something else that somebody's going to invent um, or we're going to craft together from other things. But I'm, Tracy should get the last word here. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting that you should mention that because one of the uh, uh, many other aspects of this issue that I wasn't able to deal with is the Dutch conviction that they should stop dragging their water all over the country. <laughs> Uh, uh, so much, and water is piped for tens, dozens, hundreds of kilometers, uh, uh, piped from, uh, from the, the large lake in the uh, north of Amsterdam all the way down 80, 100 kilometers to the south uh, for irrigation. And that maybe it's a better idea to just use the water where it falls, to clean it where it is, and, and stop schlepping it around all the time make the system more natural, more local, uh, uh, and more attuned to, to the existing conditions. And um, I hope I'm not giving away national secrets here, but when I went to this uh, water treatment plant, the beautiful one from the 70s, uh, some of the water comes in uh, and is in basins outside before it goes into the basins inside to actually go through the cleaning process. And uh, as if the man who took me around read my mind, he said, um, yes, we do have a backup system. We call it the Bin Laden system. <laughs> that, of course, this water, if anyone were to jump the fence and throw poison into the water, um, they need to have some kind of backup. 
So I think this applies to all the systems that you mentioned. They can all be, they can, they can break, they can be sabotaged. Uh, we'll always need a backup, and that, I think, is a reason to diversify and to use more small-scale local systems. You can't do that with everything. Sewage treatment, you can't, I mean, it really does have an economy of scale to treat sewage on a large scale. So you'd be stupid to, to, to make a lot of little sewage plants everywhere, which, which no one wants in their backyard anyway. But uh, the, uh, the diversification, making the systems more local, uh, does definitely make sense in the long run. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so water, as many people are saying, writing these days, is going to be the biggest challenge in the next century for a variety of reasons. It's a national security challenge. It's an environmental challenge. It's a safety challenge, a lot of challenges. So the topic will remain relevant. Um, I just, my, on behalf of the embassy, I'd like to thank the National Building Museum for inviting uh, Tracy here. She's a Dutch American star uh, in the Netherlands. <laughs> and um, I also want to thank um, a, very, a very typical Dutch thing to do is to give guests. Um, and I emailed Tracy earlier this afternoon if she was leaving tomorrow, and I think maybe she thought I would ha had some ulterior motive. But no, we were, in the Netherlands you give flowers, but of course since Tracy's leaving, we didn't want to give her a bunch of flowers to leave. So um, here we go. Here are some uh, very good books on Dutch design. So not water design, but other design for you. <laughs> and, you see, and Chase, you have one for you too, please. Let's give the, uh, the, the panelists a applause. Thank you.